Welcome to the setup day where we're about to launch the next generation MX-5 Miata. My name's Dean Case. I'm normally the communications officer for all things Mazda Motorsports, but today I get to kind of step back in time to the origins of the Miata. My career started with Mazda in 1986, and I get to be reunited with one of my closest friends and arguably one of the main brains behind the Miata, Bob Hall. Bob? Hi, Dean. So, Good to see me. <laughs> <laughs> This is, uh, we're going to try to have some fun with this. Bob is one of the smartest people I know in the world, knows more about cars than virtually anyone else. Crime is no fun without riddles. But uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about what it was like back then. I joined kind of midway through. They had actually done all the heavy lifting and shift the project off to Japan when I joined in 86. But, you know, there was a lot of development work still to be done. Yeah. But Bob, talk a little bit about, you know, this car is aged. So well. Much better than I have, okay? <laughs> Much better than I have. Yeah, um, it's, it's, I'm not gonna say it's timeless, okay? But it's kinda like, in my attic, there's a painting of the original Miata, and it doesn't look like this, okay? And I can't let a Miata see it, or my friend Mr. Dorian Gray, who painted it, it will just not work out as well. When, when you came up with the original concept in the early 80s, you know, did you envision that it would have a lifespan as long as it has so far and looks? Well. Yes and no. We had a document that had one page called Why Not a 10-Year Car. Japanese cars are traditionally on four-year model cycles for volume and probably five to seven on, on other things. We said, there's no reason if you design this right, it can't last 10 years. As it ended up, it came down close to, I think we were in production about nine and change on the NA. And it was, it was the idea that the design department everybody agreed on was to keep the design simple, okay? Not rely on a lot of what we call state-of-the-moment design issues, design cues. So, as a result, when we got into the stage that Japan's looking seriously at this as a project, for the longest time it was kind of like, well, let them do it so they can do the wheel covers, the next 323, do the important work. Um, we, we had the sketch program where our sketches had this kind of quasi-timeless looking car. The sketches being done by Japan on their cars, which were a front-wheel drive, two-seat coupe, and a mid-engine car, they were really evocative and like the moment of design. Yeah. So our stuff all looked old. And they had this program where they had these three proposals and they wanted to take it to two. So they showed ours and everybody was like, with ours. And the chief of the guy named Masakatsu Kato, Kato-san actually felt sorry for us because the next stage, they wanted to take the sketches from three to two, then they wanted to do two clay models and then do one and then propose that to management. And Kato felt sorry for us, so he didn't tell us we lost and he said we can do a clay model, but the intention was our clay model wouldn't be counted. Interesting. And we did the clay model. And the clay model, uh, all the cars were coupes. We had a hard top on ours that could be taken off. And we did the presentation and it was shown to the management and they were okay. And then we took the roof off. And the guy who was in charge of the mid-engine car, a guy named Yoichi Sato, who was completely insane. Sato jumps up and says in English, build that one. <laughs> and uh, they ended up saying, yeah, we'll focus on this. And it was still no project. You know, we were just, it was just a car, and there was no way at that time to slot something new into the Mazda system. So we had to actually work to warp the system to get the car in as time went on, which was in some respects the hardest job of all. Well, for me, one of the most interesting parts is, remember one of the great quotes about all the cars that were coming around the same time, and that Mercury Capri, I think the quote was, while the Miata may have a few sales, that was obviously going to be the volume. The, well, the Capri is a funny case, because the Capri showed up appeared at the Detroit, or excuse me, the Chicago Motor Show one year before the Miata. But the Capri, which was being developed in Australia by Ford Australia and under the dictate of Mercury in the States, there was a miscommunication and they never told the Aussies that it needed to have passive restraint airbags. So the Aussies completed the car, showed it, and there was no airbag. So they had to rush to get the airbags in and delay the launch of the car more than a year. We came out after. So we figured the Miata and the Capri, there would be some, some issues there. And the Mercury guys, when they saw the Miata, decided, let's put a turbo in the Capri, let's go take the Miata on. And in actual fact, the demand for the, the Capri was for the simple, non-turbo, inexpensive one. Yeah. And they were biased towards that. They tried to make it something it wasn't. The original Capri, taken as an entry-level two-seat convertible or two plus two, was great. I saw it, I, I would like the car, I called it training wheels for a Miata. Somebody will buy that, then they'll buy a Miata. But uh, it seems that the Mercury guys didn't understand their own product. Well, it's just, I mean, I remember one of the other things when we launched this, one of the key things, I'm not sure if it was from product playing US, but the fact that automatic transmission was delayed for a while, that it was only manual transmission. Those first yeah. buyers were just off the charts. 
I don't think anyone anticipated that. No. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the whole car was a, was a, a real wake-up call in some respects because all of the conventional wisdom you would apply on developing a car like this it was thrown out the window. Yeah. We expected we do. We were, we were targeting about two thousand cars a month. It, it ended up going between three and four thousand a month. Japan, where two-seat sports cars have never been a big business, they were thinking mm, maybe we'll do five hundred a month if we're lucky. Probably less, two fifty to five hundred. And they launched the car in Japan, and Japan was doing three thousand a month, and nobody was ready for it. It created real issues. We we couldn't get enough aluminum wheels. Okay, we had to kind of shake around with the model mix and do more of the base car with no aluminum wheels. It was, it, was, it was very interesting. Uh, it, was a, it was a learning curve. It was pretty steep. Let's take a look over one of the other cars mm. we had in Chicago. We had the red, white, and blue, but we also had this car, which, if I remember right, we, we got in a little bit of hot water from Japan. They weren't, yeah. Some guys weren't happy that we had this car? Yeah, they, uh, the, this was called the Club Sport or the Club Racer, depending on who you chat with. And this was pretty much steered by Mark Jordan, who was one of the two original guys who designed the Miata, starting sketching on it in 82. Um, but Mark steered this one, and this was kind of be the, the theme car. So we had at the stand, we had four Miatas, three of which were actual cars, one of which was kind of a really nice mock-up. Yeah. Um, and we had this, and this was like the pride of, uh, pride of both. And, and Japan wasn't super happy with it. But when they saw how the reaction to it was, yeah. they got a lot happier. The original, this was going to be a launch color for the car. The original plan was we're going to have five colors. We're going to have red, white, blue, yellow and British Racing Green. British Racing Green and the black interior didn't work brilliantly, so they decided to hold off on that. The yellow, they actually started, and they did some pilot production, but can I move around here? Yeah, well, part wasn't, we, there was an issue with yellow. Production hated yeah. that. No, 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 it wasn't that, but <clears throat> when a Miata body shell went into the factory, yeah. it first had the area inside the rear, yeah. for the, the, where the top sat, that, this section around the window and the rocker panel were painted black. And they were not really masked, they just kind of shot. Because yeah. then they masked that and put the color coat on. The yellow paint was not opaque enough, and you would see this weird dark shadow where the right. overspray was on the black. And they hated it. So the, the yellow was taken off. When they did the yellow limited editions in 91, they did something very interesting. At the end of shift, they took a certain number of white cars that were shot. They took the, the body shells as they went through. they do a bunch of white ones. They would be pulled offline before yeah. they got the clear coat. They would be put back on, okay? okay? So at the start of shift and the next shift, they were all painted yellow. <laughs> so they had yellow paint over the white so paint. So there was truth in because the yellow is translucent. Yes. So it, it didn't cover, it just didn't cover as well. Right. So production, <laughs> to meet the quality standards they had to have, it took an additional process. So, you know, when you talk about cover, an area like the hood and the fender, where there was no black overspray, it was fine. It went on yeah. fine. But here you had these weird shadows. So that's, they fixed that. But yeah, the yellow was supposed to be, and this thing's neat. I love the wheels. Yeah. Okay. It's got these nicely bulged fenders, just a little tiny bit. You know, it's not 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 completely crazy. No, and th these were big wheels and tires in the day. Of course, now they're, they'd be small on a uh, economy hatchback. Well, it's interesting. If you go out to an SCCA club race, this really this theme is carried out on the fender flares on E and F production cars. Is it really? So you really see the. I mean, Mark nailed the proportions perfectly. Uh, yeah. On it. Because well, you can't. I mean, you, the car's not. Over tire. Well, there's yeah. a big argument. You know, I have always liked cars with more chassis than engine. So my friends yeah. say, oh, you like underpowered cars. <laughs> Not exactly. Well, as we tell the racers, <laughs> momentum cars. Exactly right. And that, you know, anything you learn on this translates up. Absolutely. If you learn high horsepower, you may not be able to drive one. Look, if you can't go fast with 90 horsepower, 900 horsepower will not help yeah. you. Okay. Let's take a look on colors. Your personal uh, car. This is the family cars. We well, call the family, the family car. car. But, but <laughs> this was one. Uh, we had the Easter egg cars that year. Yeah. Where they painted, how many was it? It was it was six Miatas shot in these oddball colors. Yeah. And, and they were done for the MX3 project. And they did six Miatas and nine 323 hatchbacks. And they were all painted in these wild colors. Yeah. The six Miatas were painted teal. There was a metallic blue, kind of a dark metallic blue. It was really neat. There was a raspberry metallic. There was a uh, orange. Yeah. A bright solid orange. There was a pale metallic green. It was a Porsche color called ice green. And there was a metallic yellow car that we nicknamed Metallic Pus. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the, all the cars ha still exist. Some of them, we don't know where they are. The, yeah. the yellow car lives in San Diego. The dark blue car lives in San Diego. This lives in Orange County. Um, the sun kissed car, the orange car, has been around. I don't know where it is now. It was recently sold for $24,000 and it was a salvage title. It's yeah. been totaled twice. 
Um, the green car is still around, but we don't know where. But they're, they're still around. The, uh, it was funny because when this was done, the Miata mania was crazy. So it was like, yeah, I can get you a Miata, 4,000 over a sticker, yeah. sure. And as a result, all the colors in the Miata, the customers loved. And all the colors in the 323, they hated. And the 323 colors, a few of them were far better than the Miata colors. Yeah. But, but they did these six cars at the factory. And what they did was they took the body shells off after they were primed, then ran them to the prototype shop. So if you look at the VIN, the VIN, instead of having a color code number, has the letter X. Well, I just, that was probably one of the dumbest things I did during my tenure at Mazda the first time in R&D, not buying one of these, because you got one and a few of the other employees who really... Actually, actually, my brother-in-law got this. What yeah. happened was that it was a raffle. And That's right. I was allowed to tell everybody, and I, I put in, but I said, can I yeah. give the ticket to my brother-in-law? And he won it. Yeah. He, this actually isn't the one he wanted. He wanted the green. Yeah. But he's happy, and he's falling in love with this, and this is his car, so, yeah. the family car. Now, and you've done a couple of mods on this? Oh, yes, just, we, what, we, what we, you, the wheels, okay, yeah. it has these wonderful retro wheels, complete with the old Mazda yeah, logo, Yeah, the original logo. These are called Chaparral's, an outfit in uh, uh, R-Speed Miata in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Well, these, any weight great. difference on that? Or? Uh, it's a little bit lighter than the factory yeah. wheel is, it's, it's, it's a great wheel. The one thing that's kind of neat, that's new, we just put in, it has, um, it's the only Miata that I know of right now that has LED headlights. <laughs> How so, much brighter is it? It's not so much that it's brighter, but the pattern is much better okay. and it's clearer. It's really great, um, but they're kind of odd looking. And um, it's, it's basically, it's been lowered a little bit. Uh, the exhaust is what we call design intent. Yeah. Um, the first exhaust system that Hirai had done, uh, Mr. Hirai was a program manager, didn't meet the European and the Japanese drive-by, so they, okay. the sound was a little too loud. This is closer to that. We use the diameter pipe in the first one and such. Um, and it's got a tonneau cover, which is kind of neat for just one person in it. Uh, it's just kind of neat. It's a 50,000 mile car. It's, it's a uh, late 1990-built car. So just trying to think back of what people would be interested in. So any particular story from that, you know, the early years that, you know, you know, any of the clinics or, or just the test trips, the uh, the target setting trips, the evaluation trips. Well, there, there was, you know, the, the one thing that was funny is, is that, and, and this is where I think some of the guys in the U.S., we get too much credit, okay? We would work on the project for two weeks. We work on it for a month. Then we do something important like, you know, we're, we're doing the uh, clinic for the upholstery on the next 929. Yeah. Something, you know, important. And the only guys that worked full time were Mr. Hirai and his team in Hiroshima. Yeah. They were the real guys that made the car. We had a bunch of ideas. We had a concept. We had some proposals and design. But at the end of the day, we couldn't do the car, and he did the car, and his people did the car. And it was interesting, his team was really great, because he had Kijima, who was doing his chassis, who became yeah. the program manager for the second and third generation yeah. cars. And Yamamoto, who worked at Kijima yeah. on the car, he became the program manager for the new car. And, and there's been this, this wonderful consistency. And that's, that's, I think, one of the reasons the cars worked as well. But, you know, it's interesting. Miata's been around 25 years, and we've got basically the fourth generation starting soon. And the Miata, has stayed the same, some of the, the stuff that is basic to it on the concept. And to me, the concept of the car is basically uh, a, a three element graphic that's, you know, a less than sign, an equal sign, and a greater sign, because it means less is more. Yeah, and we'll, we'll blend in the presentation. Yeah. The that's, utterly, that's utterly important to it. And that's been constant through all of them, and it's especially well done on the new car. Oh, I agree. I mean, okay. Back, I mean, it was a clean sheet of paper to do this, which has its own set of challenges. But, but, but it's also relatively easy. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's so easy for people, you look at all the second generation cars of other brands that have been mucked up. Yeah, I think, I think Kijima and, and Yamamoto have done an utterly brilliant job with this, okay? And, and that's the thing that to me is just so great, okay? When you think about it, you have to ignore some of that feedback when you think about it. Oh, I'd like more power, I'd like a bigger stereo, I'd like all these things well, which destroy the weight. And, and that's one of the things that I think, stuff like Honda, Toyota, GM, the, the Honda S2000 was conceived and the project started as the S1600. Mm. And they said, we can put a bigger engine in, we can make it more, and everything more was not less. Right. And that's where they dropped the ball big time. So there have been all these challengers and they seem to forget less is more. They think more is more and what happens is more is less because they sell fewer cars. Mm. But, no. but I was going to say, four generations, three generations, 25 years, okay, the MGB was in production 18 years in one generation that started out as a relatively contemporary car and ended no. up as a coelacanth, okay? It was basically, they never bothered to mm. adapt the car to the environment and to the world. And the reason that the, the Miata has worked is with each version, 
it has moved with the times while keeping the key elements of the car fixed. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to do, and I, I have to admit, I'm more power to Mazda for pulling Oh, I know, the, the whole concept of lightweight sports. And the, the concept's easy. But the execution and then the main right. no and then the maintenance of the concept that's the hard part it's easy to conceive it's easy to do that one thing but to maintain it and to make sure it remains relevant that's the hard part well one of the other things that was key i think on this vehicle the success is you know i remember us working uh, very diligently to make sure that the cost of ownership was low and the insurance Remember that, the crash testing and making sure, sure that... And, and, and making sure that some components weren't where it would cost a lot to re right. replace them. Yeah, that we've yeah. actually considered that. Because you look at the number of other cars that, you know, young single males wanted, but their insurance was so bad, it, it basically put the car out of production. Well, that was, that was one of the problems we had with the RX-7, the last yeah. generation. We had a lot of people that loved it because it was turbo. You're under 25, you couldn't insure the damn thing. Right. And that's kind of sad, but, you know, again, you learn from the mistakes. Okay, and, and I think the mistakes on the, uh, the MX-5 and it's uh, all the fault views are pretty few and far between. No, I, just, I mean, I'm just honored to have, you know, I had a chance to, my little part in it. Hardest job we had was keeping, you know, you out of the car for the longest time <laughs> since, you know, we wanted real engineers working on it. <laughs> Excuse me. But back in the days, you know, it's interesting for those of you who are in Southern California, you know, Mazda headquarters right now is next door to Taco Bell. And when I joined the company, you guys had shifted around. You bought the adjoining we property. We bought the old Taco Bell the old building. Taco Bell and we building. used it as we used it as a combination studio and planning office. And we, we walked in on Monday mornings. It smelled like taco shells. Yes, it did. And we could never find where they were. It was very upsetting. You so. know? And the other problem with those damn chihuahuas. Damn, there were so <laughs> no, many of them. That predates the chihuahuas. Oh, sorry. So sorry remember, it was the entire office decorated like a 1970s Taco Bell. Oh, it was great. Lovely, it was great. lovely it was decor. And those wonderful shades of brown and, and, and shag patterns on those shag carpet and patterns that have not been seen yeah. outside of a van in luckily, decades. Yeah, okay. luckily none of those uh, made, it way, made its way into a Mazda. Of the other cars we brought out here, any one in particular, you know, the coupe, was that... Had you already left, or was that... I, I, uh, the, the coupe project actually started because relatively early on in the program, oh. When, when the, the Miata program had started and it was becoming a real car, um, Japan got very nervous yeah. about having only a convertible. They, I mean, like, hyper nervous. So what they ended up doing, they asked us to do a study on a coupe. And Tom Matano and Mark Jordan worked together and came up with a coupe and they did a clay model and they did a, what's called a splash, where you take the clay model and you put fiberglass yeah. over it so you can make a mold of an upper. Between the time the program started and they made the splash, Japan decided we don't need a coupe. So it was like, okay, fine. A few years after the car launched, I've left the company. Yeah. Um, Tom and Mark or somebody decided, let's make a show car. And they did a car for the New York show. Yeah. And uh, that well, was it. I was really surprised. I said, hey, I've seen that yeah. thing before. <laughs> well, I always remember part of the argument was, you know, when you're a car company, you can't cannibalize your own sales. And the coupe would have taken away from RX-7. But there was, another, there was another problem, the, a bigger issue, that, that at the end of the day, when you take a coupe and make a convertible, you end up with a pretty heavy convertible. Yeah. Because you've got to cut off the roof right, that carries right. it. When you take a convertible and make a coupe, because you have a tougher body structure, yeah. you come up with a pretty heavy coupe. Yeah. So it really, it wasn't, it, it had, the performance would mean you need more engine, and then you get into the thing about, yeah. okay, now we're encroaching on, on RX-7. When we did the first... We did the first Miata. We had a benefit that the first generation RX-7 was still on sale. And we called that our glass ceiling. But we yeah. knew there would be a second generation. And we knew that the second generation would have a progression where it would get faster and more expensive and bigger. So when they went from SA, SA to uh, the F, uh, sorry, from the SA to the S, uh, FC, which is the second generation car, the Miata program was kind of quasi-official, but it wasn't real. So we were ab actually able to keep an eye out on the FC, the second gen. RX-7 has moved up and it moved our glass ceiling forward. So we always knew that when we were going in, but this was probably a little, getting a little too close. Yeah. But well, I like it, it looked neat. And, yeah, you know, it was a great looking car. I just remember, you know, it was a magical time there, but you know, you're absolutely right. You know, what we did in the US was little bits and pieces of a project. Sure. The mothership in Japan, the, the, they did the heavy lifting. Yeah, and, and they were the guys that, that would say, do this, do that, that's great, work on that a little bit. We don't really have any interest in that. And, and you, you, it's right, you, know, but you just do what you gotta do. The, what people should keep in mind, though, is you know it takes a big team to develop a complex project like this. Yeah. But it takes a few key people with the right vision. And Bob's well, very modest, but some kind of supervision. If I had supervision, I wouldn't. No, be no, but, I, I, but, I wouldn't be here. But right? ultimately, and it's like, you know, I'm biased because I worked with this guy for so many years. But 
you know, it was Bob's leadership of partly getting everyone rallied around what we needed to do. And well, I mean, that and the coercion, the photographs I took and <laughs> such. Yeah, okay. I mean, it worked. It worked very well. As you can see, we had a good time all the working there and just a lot of neat people that worked with us. You know, um, you know, we didn't even mention, you know, Wu Hong Chin, who had some work on the original one. And guys like that, just immensely talented Jim people. Kilborn. Jim Kilborn. Who's still with Mazda. Right. And, and Jim, Jim was one of these guys that would sit down and if you had a problem that had to be worked out in terms of market position or something, he'd sit and he would do it until it was done. He would crunch the data. I yeah. mean, he was, He was great. You know, he was great. And, and, he, and he loves cars, which was neat, even though he had a pickup truck. So, but you know, John Morrell, Marky uh, Dillon, who became Marky Morrell, Girl Peter Cairns, just uh, all, John Simmons. John Simmons, yeah. yeah. Yep, all these these people that I hired, that, you know, that they can blame me for their, their <laughs> careers. <sighs> so, any parting words of wisdom, Bob? Well, no. <laughs> He's got many parting words of wisdom. He's just not sharing them. But we're going to wander around, look at some of the other cars. And I think actually we're going to have to go up and look on the hillside this weekend when we're here for the rest of the festival when Miatas at Mazda Raceway take over. Yes. It'd be interesting to see if some of those, uh, the oddball color cars show up. Yeah, that, that's. I it's, bet you a few of them are going to be I here. have been told that. that Metallic pus may be here. Well, I think we. And it'd be fun to see that. I want to okay. organize a Roy G. Biv photo. That'd be good. I think That'd that be would good. be good. So um, we're gonna go out and have some fun looking around other things around the whole Miyazawa Mazda Raceway weekend.